Before the lectureship, we were studying some things about the church, and we mentioned about the church being in the eternal purpose of God, and then we studied about the church beginning in Jerusalem. Those are two identifying marks of the church that Jesus shed his blood to purchase. There are a number of identifying marks. And in the study we did just before the lectureship, we consulted Isaiah chapter 2. And we noticed how that the house of God is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. And that that house was predicted by Isaiah some 700 or more years before Jesus walked this earth. We have also pointed out from time to time that in Jesus' promise to build his church in Matthew 16, that he used the word church and kingdom interchangeably. The kingdom is the church and the church is the kingdom. Those are not just two terms used to describe the same institution, the institution of the saved. There are several other terms in the scriptures that describe the church. But they are two, and yet many times people make the church one institution and the kingdom entirely something else. But they are not. As you study the scriptures, and as you study, you handle a right or right to divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. It is important to understand as you study with people today that a great many of them, believing what I said a moment ago about the church being one thing and the kingdom something else, still look for the Lord's kingdom to be established in our future somewhere. And it is nothing like the kingdom described on the pages of the New Testament. It's an earthly kingdom. And all sorts of things go along with that false theory known as premillennialism. But when again you rightly divide the word of truth, it's not difficult to see that the kingdom that is prophesied in the Old Testament was established almost 2,000 years ago. In Jerusalem, we'll go a little further than that and say, not just in Jerusalem, but in Jerusalem following the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. Any church not bearing these marks cannot be the church of our Lord. Now, what I'm coming from here is the fact that the New Testament is an infallible divine pattern, which has been rejected by many especially in the church. A pattern is nothing more than a teaching to. Think about it for a minute. You have a dress pattern. It teaches you how to cut out that dress and those people who know how to do those things to read what a dress pattern says. And you can think of blueprints and patterns and so forth. So why anybody would say the New Testament is not being God's word an infallible inspired pattern, I don't know. But I venture a guess. You want to get out from under some of the directions. It's sort of like people who say, I don't believe in God and I accept evolution. Well, if you prove to them that evolution is false, then you mess them up completely because the whole problem with the thing in the first place is that they don't want to admit to God who created all things because that would imply they're one of his creatures and he has control over them and they're not going to submit to anybody any more than they have to and usually as it suits them. So when we study this today, I want to go back to an Old Testament book to you who are studied in the scriptures and in this area of study. This is uh, not new material, at least I hope it's not. But we turn back to Daniel, there in the captivity. Nebuchadnezzar is king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He cannot remember what he dreamed. He wants some of his, uh, or his soothsayers and stargazers and so forth to come and tell him what he dreamed. And when they tell him what he dreamed, he wants them to interpret it. 
course they can't. But Daniel, being a faithful servant of the Most High God, is the one who comes forward and makes it clear what he can do, but not by his own power. He would be doing it as God directed him and led him to remind Nebuchadnezzar of that dream, what he saw in it, and then to interpret the great figure that he dreamed and the different parts of it made of different substances. But for our purposes here, talking about the kingdom, being able to identify it, knowing that it is the church, the two terms used interchangeably in the New Testament, we will look at that familiar part of that great figure as Daniel interprets it in Daniel 2.44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. At the end of that verse, he'll say, it shall stand forever. Well, now in the days of these kings... Nebuchadnezzar was over the Babylonian Empire. They would be overthrown by the Medes and Persians. Then Alexander the Great would knock them off. His kingdom would be divided up among his generals. And then all about the time this is going on, there's a little group of people over in Rome who are conquering the whole Italian boot and about to expand all over the place. And they do, and thus the Roman Empire. So in the days of these kings, well, it's in the days of the Roman emperors, and kings, if you want to call them that. King simply meaning here a monarch or the fellow that has the last say, but it comes to ruling things. So it's going to come this kingdom that shall not be destroyed, never be destroyed, and will stand forever. It's going to start in the days of the Romans. Now there's another identifying mark. If somebody says that the church started in 1600 or somebody says it started during the days of Nebuchadnezzar, then you know they're wrong because the Bible says it'll start in the Roman kings. Well, it was in the mind of God. He reveals it in words. All the Old Testament centering around Christ and how he'll save man, and that involves the house of God. You can't study about Christ and not study about his family because his family is going to be the ones he saves. Thus in Acts 2, those who are obedient to the gospel, Jesus himself adds to his church, verse 47. That's important to keep in mind. So when you study about Christ, and that's all you want to study about, then you're ignoring the very institution he shed his blood to purchase, which establishes how great in the mind of God that institution is that the Son of God was shed his blood to purchase it. And we... To reflect upon the church is to reflect upon its purchase price. I think in our efforts to get over to a denominational world that cannot think outside of its denominational box, that one of the things that a person needs to saddle on them is the fact that because they don't believe a church has anything to do with salvation. You're saved by Christ personally. You choose what church you want to go to. It suits you, and that's denominationalism. But you have to realize that Jesus purchased his church, Acts 20, 28, with his blood. Thus, the church is worth the purchase price. And to belittle and bemean it is to belittle and bemean the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, they don't want to do that. But by implication, they do. And there's a great example of how logic, as Jeff spoke on in the lectureships, employed in understanding an important point in the Scripture. If you reject the church, you reject the blood of Christ because the blood of Christ was shed to purchase the church. And you can talk about the other way, too, since he used his blood to purchase the church, being shed for the remission of sins. Then if you spurn the blood of Christ, you're really spurning the church because that's what it took. Nothing else would work to purchase the church. So implication is a very important point. So now in the days of the Roman kings, this kingdom would be established. Again, when you look at kingdom before Acts 2, it's future tense. Kingdom from Acts 2 forward is in reality. In the days of those Roman kings came John the Immerser, the baptizer, 
And he came preaching to the Jews to get them ready for the Messiah who according to the flesh from the family of David would come to them. So he said, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This bottle of water here is at hand. It's right there where I can get it immediately. That's an idea that's a bit figurative, but it says it's nearby, not far away. So that's what John said. After John had been put into prison, our Lord then preached the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Mark 1 and verse 15. Again, all said, there in Israel of long ago under the dominion of the empire of Rome. Jesus later taught the disciples to pray for the coming of the kingdom. Remember when the disciples said, John teaches his disciples, would you teach us also how to pray? And so we have the model prayer. World round about us, religious world, calls that's the Lord's prayer. Well, it's not. It's the model prayer. It was given in answer to the disciples saying, teach us to pray. Which also says to us, we need to be taught to pray. And so we have a model. I don't know why the people who reject pattern won't reject model, but... Nevertheless, uh, that's what it is. It's a model for us to learn from. And the Lord gave it that purpose. Well, he says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. I've heard people recite that in religious services like this in various churches just as it's printed. You know, today you can't pr pray all of that prayer just as it was uttered by Christ. And here's one of the reasons why. When he prayed, thy kingdom come, it had not yet come. Well, what can we do in following the model prayer as we follow, uh, learn rather, how to speak in prayer to God when it comes to the kingdom? Well, can't we spread for the, uh, pray for the spread of the borders of the kingdom? Can't we pray for the citizens in the kingdom? And so forth. And that's how I would simply adjust that model prayer to fit the reality of the kingdom having already been established. It can't come because it's here. Matthew 6, 9, and 10. Christ taught that the kingdom was to come during the lifetime of some of the then living disciples. In Mark 9 and verse 1, he says, There be some of you that stand here which shall not taste of death till ye have seen the kingdom come with power. Again, Mark 9, 1. Well, now, either the kingdom has been established or else are some pretty old folks on this earth today who actually were there at the time Christ said this and they're still waiting to see for the kingdom come with power. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That's absurdity, and that's the only way to describe it. They were there, and they were alive when the kingdom come, and they saw it, and they saw it come with power. Now, that's almost 2,000 years ago. In Matthew 18, in verse number 3, we see that the disciples of Christ, the learners of the Christ, had not at that time entered the kingdom. Jesus said, except you repent or except you turn and become as little children, in many innocents, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. So there was still the need to have the proper disposition of mind toward God, toward oneself and everybody else, especially the will of heaven, that you'd be able to receive it as you ought to and learn from God how to enter into that kingdom of heaven. In sending out the 70 when it came to the limited commission to the Jews, in Luke 10 and verse 9, he said he had them preach the kingdom of heaven is come nigh or near unto you. That is, it's soon to be established. Now when we come on through to the time of the observance of Passover and out of the Passover, 
our Lord originated the Lord's Supper. He makes this interesting comment. I shall not drink from henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Luke twenty two eighteen. So at the time on the night that he was betrayed, that he instituted the Lord's Supper, it had not yet come then. But they're still there at the end of the Lord's ministry. He's going to die the next day. He's going to go to the cross, suffering terrible pains and anguish and shame, and in so doing, offer his sinless body a sacrifice for our sins and shed his blood from that body for the remission of sins. But at this time, as he institutes the very supper, that uh, is to remember and show forth the death of Christ till he come again. The kingdom is not yet established. So now we come to the exact date of the kingdom of Jesus Christ or the church, the family of God, 1 Timothy 3.15, was established. Now we have to drop back to a passage we've already used, and that's Mark 9 and verse 1. Remember, the kingdom was to come with power. And if you're a student of the scriptures, you will recall further that the power was to come upon the apostles of Christ. He had chosen them as the witnesses and as the ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth. It's through them, by the Holy Spirit, we have a New Testament of Jesus Christ making up the second part of the Bible, Luke 24, 49. And in reading the scriptures, we see that that power came on the apostles in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. Now, if you want to add a little to that, go to John's Gospel and read John chapters 14, 15, and 16, where you have a thorough discussion of the Holy Spirit's work with the apostles of Christ. They wouldn't be able to grasp a great many things until it was ready for them to do it, and they wouldn't be ready for that to happen till they would be endued with power from on high, which came and is described by Luke in Acts chapter 2, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, meaning a relationship was established and power granted to them, like had been as far as the relationship that existed between them and the Christ as he was in the flesh. But now the Holy Spirit's not flesh. So it didn't make any difference where the apostles were to do what Christ called them to do and sent them out to do. They would always have the third person of the Godhead with them to enable them to remember all things that Jesus had taught them and to guide them into all truth. When people today talk about having the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, they still try to study their Bibles and learn from it. If you were an apostle of Christ, you could have written one. And guess what? That's exactly what they did. And thus, the apostles and prophets through the Holy Spirit has produced the last will and testament of Jesus Christ that is the pattern and the standard for learning how to become a Christian, all about Christ, and the great family of God that is the church or the kingdom that was established in Jerusalem and purchased by the blood of Christ in the long ago. So the kingdom came on that Pentecost day and you can read it in your own Bibles in Acts chapter 2. Peter, as well as the other apostles, being the ambassadors of the court of heaven, undergone the miraculous power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now were guided directly by him and what they uttered. And Peter, standing up with the eleven, proclaimed the record or the gospel for the first time in its fullness as Luke has recorded it in Acts 2. So therein, the keys of the kingdom. That is, you know, a key to the door. We have all sorts of fun with keys to doors around here. But when you can't find a key in the doors, lock, you don't get in in normal situations. 
So we have to have keys to be able to unlock the door. Well, that's what's meant when Matthew 16, Matthew 16, when Jesus promised to build the church, verse 18, that he promised Peter the keys of the kingdom. But John 14, 15, and 16 says the power that Peter received, all the apostles received, and thus Peter stood up with the eleven and they all preached. And they preached as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So keys are the symbol of authority. The apostles had authority. No other human being that walked this earth had the authority the apostles of Jesus Christ had for the reasons that you read of in Acts 1 and 2. Thus, when they preached, they opened the door. They had that authority through the power of the Holy Spirit to extend to men the way of forgiveness of sins. Thus, when the Gospels preach, proving that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that men put him to death, but God did not leave him dead, his tomb is empty. He is now declared the risen Savior, and he at that time sat at the right hand of God, ruling as he does even now. Well, what do you rule over? A kingdom. How can he be ruling as he was pronounced to be doing so in Acts 2? If there wasn't a kingdom to rule over. So there is when the kingdom started. But the kingdom is the church. And the church is the kingdom. The family of God. 1 Timothy 3.15. There's when it started. Any church. That claims to have started before that. Is not the church of Christ. As that term is defined and used. In your own New Testament. Don't let. Even though we're members of the church. Most of us. Don't let people's interpretations fitted into a denominational system conjured up by the minds of men cause you to take a view of the church as if it is just one church among many, all of them produced by men, and none of them having really anything directly to do with your salvation. So Peter exercised the authority on Acts 2, and when they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They had already believed, so we follow the example. We take people where they find them. If you find an atheist, then you start teaching the things that prove God's existence. If you find somebody that doesn't believe Jesus Christ is deity, then you start teaching those things to that person where you find him, and that is the teaching that Jesus Christ is deity. And so on. The Bible's the Word of God. You know, that's not that far away. You study with the Mormon. You're going to have to show that person by proper teaching and evidence that there is but one book from God, and that's the Bible. And their book of Mormon and other books like that, that's not the Bible. That's not God's Word. And so they are going to have to be met to where you can have what is the final standard of authority in determining right and wrong. Well, if you don't do that, you might as well not try to study with them. Because you've got to settle on the right authority. Same thing's true of Jehovah's Witnesses and numbers of others. So you take them where you find them. These folks have already been led to belief in Jesus Christ on the evidence in the gospel preached to them. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Their conscience hurt them. It is a terrible thing when your conscience will not hurt you when you know you've done contrary to God's will. Do you know that makes it impossible for you to be saved? Think about it for a minute. If your conscience can't prick you because of what you've done by rejecting the truth so long that it doesn't bother you anymore, tell me what's going to help you be saved. What's going to motivate you? It can. These folks were pricked in their heart. And as believers, Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises unto you and to your children and all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he urged them, of course, to save yourself from this crooked generation. So he preached the terms of admission into the kingdom. If you please, he used the keys and opened wide the door of entrance into the kingdom of heaven, prophesied so long ago, even at that date, by Daniel in Daniel 2, 44. 3,000 became citizens of that kingdom on that day. 
the gospel was preached. Men in honest hearts heard it, Luke 8, 15, and they responded as all men ought to, by honestly believing and obeying the truth. Then they that received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. That is, they knew about the ambassadors of the court of heaven, having direction by the Holy Spirit, that that's the way Jesus was telling them what to do. That's why they stayed in Jerusalem so long, is so they could learn how to live the Christian life. They didn't come planning on doing that. They were devout men gathered out of every nation under heaven, Luke tells us, but they were coming there to do what they understood God wanted them to do in observing a feast day. They hadn't planned on being there that long. And so out of their love for the truth and faith in God and being Christians, they stayed to be taught how to live the Christian life. Isn't that an amazing thing? I think we brush over that too quickly. These folks just completely changed their schedule to stay in Jerusalem to learn how to live the Christian life. Well, when you can get anybody to change their schedule to learn the Bible, to avail themselves of opportunities, that's saying a lot about that person. And by their fruit, she shall know them. Some years after Pentecost, Paul wrote that the brethren had been translated into the kingdom. When he wrote the church in Colossae, in Colossians 1 and verse 13, he said, "...who hath delivered us out of the power of darkness." and translated us into the kingdom of God's dear Son, or the American standard says, the Son of His love. Now, you can't say that unless they're in the kingdom. Who's guiding Paul to write part of the New Testament of Christ as he writes this letter to the church in Colossae? Why, it's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit seemed to think these folks 2,000 years ago about were in the kingdom, and so they were. They couldn't have been translated into the kingdom. If it did not exist, well, what does that do to the idea that the kingdom's yet in our future? I'll tell you what it does to it. It destroys it. It makes such a teaching palpably false because the kingdom has been here since the day of Pentecost, the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. So that thing falls flat on the floor. The only thing lacking like needs to be ground into the dirt from which it came. The absurdity of the theory is again seen when you take it and put it alongside the inspired Hebrews writer in Hebrews 12 and verse 28. Now he says to those people, wherefore receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I like a kingdom like that. You know how much concern we have that the United States as a government can be shaken? And in fact, there's a whole lot of people trying to shake the tree right now. And it's a shaking a lot harder than it was 50 years ago. But I don't know what will happen eventually to this nation because in the world of history, nations have arisen and nations have fallen. Nations have arisen, they remain, but they change radically as governments came and went. Don't get the idea that if the United States collapsed completely that it changes a thing about the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't. Jesus promised us that his word will be here, though heaven and earth pass away. So we'll always have the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, where we can plant it anywhere, regardless of what nation it's in. Now, the church of our Lord is not an American institution. It might come strange to some people, but it's not. When we would preach in Russia, because there's a bit of prejudice among the Russians toward the Americans, we made clear to begin with every way we could, we're not preaching Americanism to you. We're preaching a religion that began in your part of the world, in the East. There's all sorts of ways that one can get points across if one thinks a bit. We've received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, and I like that. It cannot be shaken, and it will stand forever. That's what Daniel said, didn't he? If we have received a kingdom which will stand forever then it cannot let another kingdom begin of the nature of this one. So no kingdom can be established in the future, and it's preposterous to look for the king to establish such a kingdom on this earth. 
Jesus had said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. Well, where does Christ rule? Right hand of his Father. Our names are written in heaven. Which simply means we sojourn here. Do you know what a sojourner is? Well, we use the word pilgrim a lot. But a sojourner has no certain place. It doesn't belong to him. He's not putting down roots there. He's not planning on staying. He's just moving through. All of us as Christians would grow more in faith if we'd realize we we're just moving through and quit trying to put down roots. And quit trying to view this life as if I'm going to have this, I'm going to have that, and whatever. This life's to be used for one thing, to find God, learn the truth, obey the truth, and prepare in what time we have here to go to eternity because we're not leaving eternity. That's where you put down roots. As the prophet called it, the long home. I can't conceive of eternity. I can just say it doesn't end. But I want to go to a place where I don't end. You ever think of it that way? You're going to end in this world. It's pointed unto men once to die after this judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. I've got to end my earthly sojourn. Now, I'll either it happen by my death or if I'm alive and the Lord comes back. I prefer being alive and the Lord comes back because that means it'll just be a great transition from this state into the resurrected body, caught up to be with the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. But we're going to quit the walks of this life. Got to come to an end. No use acting like and making our plans if it's not. You young people here, some of you are teenagers, some not yet teens. It's not too early for you to realize what you've got ahead of you is to get ready for heaven. That's all there is to it. You have no other business really chief on your mind than get ready for heaven. You, whatever you involve yourself in on this earth, earning a living, whatever it is, should not handicap you in getting as close to God as you can in this world. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says, draw nigh or near to God, and he will draw near to you. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. I don't know how to resist the devil, except that I draw near to God. I don't know how to draw near to God, except I study his will and do what he asked me to do. <coughs> Yet we persist in trying to put down roots here. Some of us expect to be here at 70, 80, 90, whatever. And some of us don't get to 50. You know, having lived as long at least as I have, I can think of a whole host of folks that were my age bracket died a long time ago. I think of John Carter who sat beside me in study hall in 1963, 64. Yet in that summer, after we graduated, he would drive off, dive off a bridge on the Little Missouri River and break his neck and be a paraplegic for a year and die. Think how long he's been dead. So when I remember, he's forever young. How many thought they had a life ahead of them? They didn't. And it can happen, you know, just that fast. And you're gone. That's it. Gone. And yet we make our decisions, we flounder around. And then someday the silver cord broken, and usually when we least expect it. So why not be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? A member of the Lord's church, a child and family of God. Why not? It's here. The Lord gives us time. Peter says, the Lord's not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. So you and the church are faithful. Look round about you. Most everybody you're going to see is lost. Try to think of a way to get their attention, to show them they ought to be thinking about it. I don't know what you may have in mind when it comes to that, the people you associate with. But the key is, do you think that way? That's evangelism. Do you think that way? Wherever you are, are you looking for a door to try to teach somebody the truth? Well, I assure you, you'll get the door slammed in your face a lot more than you get it open. That's the nature of the case. But why should that stop us? I'm on the way to heaven, and I'm not going to be happy till I get there. 
Now understand how I mean that. I'm content, for I have learned to be content whatsoever state I am. I'm not satisfied, though. <laughs> I'm not going to be satisfied till I'm in my resurrected body, glorified like Christ, to walk with Him in heaven. Any person who's a member of the body of Christ and a child of God who earns for heaven, how can you be satisfied here on this earth? I don't. I don't understand it. So as we close the lesson this morning, let's realize that we're in transition. We're pilgrims. We're sojourners. And that we journey toward eternity where we'll abide forever. We must first die, but there must be then the resurrection and the judgment. Are we preparing ourselves in the time we have to be able to hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Brethren, if you don't yearn to hear that, you better recheck your faith in God and the gospel system and love of God and godly things. If you haven't become a Christian, we studied this morning what to do to become one. We can only urge you to do so. If as a child of God you have sinned and you haven't repented of those sins, they're privately known, take care of it. But repent and confess it to God and ask Him to forgive you. If you brought reproach on the church by living like the world rather than a Christian, and that reflects on the body of Christ, we ask you to repent of those sins, come confessing them. We'll pray with you and for you, and God will forgive. Are you subject to the invitation of Jesus? If you are, would you come while we stand and sing?